I will introduce our first speaker of the night, uh, who describes herself as a as a as a big nerd, and she's a. Is that is that right? Oh, <laughs> as I as I called her a big nerd, she went oh, which is pretty much the most nerdy response that you could do. <laughs> You're being called a big nerd. Um, but, uh, so Hannah's great. She actually came to me and Kaylee uh, in October at a nerd night, and there's actually photographic evidence. If you go to Lindsay's Diet, um, there's a representative from Lindsay's Diet here tonight, which is where all the photographs go, and you go to October's, there's actually photographic evidence of Hannah pitching this talk um, in the intermission, which, uh, of course, anyone else could do. If anyone has an idea for a talk, yeah. you could do. Um, and uh, that was the impetus uh, for this. She hadn't quite formed it, and over the, uh, the following months, she formed this uh, really awesome idea. Um, Hannah is also a, a cookbook uh, author. She's also a, a, a cooking TV host, uh, and also a Science World employee and all-around nerd. Let's give a warm welcome to Hannah Asuko Devlison. Hello. <laughs> thank you so much for having me, and also thank you so much to all of the friendly faces who are here. It's wonderful and also terrifying. <laughs> um, so for those of you who I don't know, I, I feel like it's important to tell you a little bit about the fact that I have a double life. So during the day, I work at Science World. I work with the exhibits department. We make nerdy things that make you excited about science. And at night, I teach Japanese cooking. Um, culturally, though, I also kind of have this double life. My mom is Japanese, my dad's German. Uh, they're in the audience, actually. Uh, <laughs> and my brother and I were born here, so we kind of like straddle this cultural boundary. We lead a double life that way as well. Um, but when it comes to my Japanese cooking, <clears throat> and teaching people about Japanese food, I really have, no matter whether it's a blog or my cookbook, which is available here tonight, uh, <laughs> or a television show, my mission is the same. My mission is to get you cooking Japanese food at home. Like, Japanese food has this awesome prestige, but it also is this big barrier, I think, to people making it at home. But really, like, millions and millions of people make it every day. They are called Japanese people. So I really think you can do it as well. So when I, when I created my cookbook, Let's Cooking, I took my usual nerdy approach, and so I did a lot of like user testing. I did focus groups. I really wanted to know um, how I could present basic Japanese food in a way that was going to get you actually cooking and owning these recipes and doing them at home. Um, so a lot of that process was gathering feedback. And after publishing the book, I've continued to gather feedback. And there is this just one recipe that every mother makes. Everybody has made this recipe. Maybe like 50% of you have. I don't know. Um, it's, it's this one, which is weird. It's, it's not one of the ones that people said they wanted. It's okonomiyaki. For those of you who don't know what okonomiyaki is, it is a savory cabbage pancake with savory sauces on top and um, like sprinkles and stuff. You can put meat in it, you can put fish in it, you can put cheese in it, it's very versatile. And I thought, it's so weird that people make this one thing. What is it about this recipe that is so accessible? Like, if I could harness the power of this one recipe and make a whole bunch of other recipes that are like this, I could really get people cooking at home. So I asked people, why do you make this recipe and they told me three things. One was that like the barrier to getting all these fancy ingredients was pretty low. One was that it's like it's a very versatile thing. Um, but most compellingly was that people were like, well, I know what a pancake is. So they kind of just got the concept of a pancake. They've eaten it before. They might have made one before. And so I realized, okay, this okonomiyaki, it has this magical like combination of its familiar enough, that it's accessible, and it's foreign enough that it's exciting, and I want to try making it. So then I realized, oh my god, Japanese food is full of recipes like these. You may not know them, but there are recipes like this. Like top left is hambagu, which is a hamburger patty with no bun, served with rice. Uh, top right, omuraisu, 
a French style omelet wrapped around lovingly around Chinese fried rice. Bottom left is a Dutch croquette. And bottom right is when the uh, Japanese adopted Chinese dumplings, they made gyoza. So there's like all these foods that have some degree of familiarity but are foreign enough. And I thought, oh my gosh, when these foods came into Japan, they were kind of altered and made Japanese with some, there must be some techniques out there. And that's what I call Japification. So then I set about on my quest to discover what were these techniques of Japification. If I can find these rules, I can apply them to create recipes that you will make at home. And so what I wanted to do was head out there, figure out what, what is out there in Japan, um, find out where those foods came from, and then glean the essence of that Japified-ness, the Japanese-ness of those recipes, and then use them to make other delicious foods. So I started in Japan. I, I went to a, a restaurangai, which is like a restaurant street. We don't really have them here, but I went to like the suburbs. So it was like a place that like a typical Japanese person could go. Um, it's just like a whole street just of restaurants. I took a picture of every single menu. And when I came home, in my free time, I made a database. Uh, I listed every single, <laughs> woo <-hoo! laughs> uh, I listed every single dish, I translated it. I have a giant list of every dish that's available there. Uh, and then I went like, okay, where do all these foods come from? So that was my next step. So I went back into history, I did a lot of reading, and I discovered that like, basically nothing that you know of as Japanese food comes from Japan. Like even sushi came to Japan from China. Uh, in the 8th century. Even tempura came to Japan from Portugal, of all places, right? And then after um, this period of national isolation, Japan opens its borders in 1854, and there's a freaking explosion of, of foreign foods that have come into Japan. But they've all kind of been Japified and made to suit Japanese tastes. So I took those data points and I assigned them uh, countries of influence. So here's one example. So every data point went through this process. Uh, for Katsusando, tonkatsu is like a Wiener schnitzel. So Wiener is Vienna. So Austria is the origin of the Wiener schnitzel. So Austria gets one point. Uh, but the schnitzel came to Japan through French cooking and French restaurants. So France gets a point. Um, and it's in a sandwich, so Britain gets a point. Thank you, Earl of Sandwich. And when I put it all together, the map looks like this. So in Japanese restaurants, Japan has the most influence, obvious. Um, but not that terribly far behind. France, China, the US, and Italy have quite a bit of influence on the Japanese culinary landscape. So this is one way to look at my data. Um, I did a little bit more reading, though, and food academics look at Japanese food as having kind of three avenues of influence. Rather than all these disparate countries, they go like, well, there's really three, like, there's a tripod. There's Japanese influence, there's Chinese influence, and then there's like, just like Western influence, you know, because we all look the same. Um, so like I took Britain and all European and all, all that, all of us together, and uh, it's weird. Western food has a huge influence on Japanese cuisine. So that's the data. And then I went and I looked for patterns. I was like, all right, so what was it that made this one thing kind of Japanese? How did they Japify it? So I went like each row by each row and I was like, okay, steak, they cut it up small so you can pick it up with your chopsticks. So r Japification rule number one, cut your food small. Like, oh, Japanese curry, it's not spicy. We don't like spicy in Japan. Um, so like, make it not spicy, Japanese rule number two. And I'm, I'm sure you can imagine it, this list just got giant and really unwieldy. And so I was quite frustrated, but I, I figured out I had to take a step back and kind of see if I can get broader categories of Japification. And I came up with three simple rules to Japify your meal. Um, but this is also the point where I have to say my research is incomplete and this framework is yet untested. So you guys are all going to be my test subjects tonight. Um, I don't know if you sign the release forms on your way in, but um, anyways, we'll only take voluntary participation. Um, okay, so here are my three rules. I'm gonna tell you what they are, and then I'm gonna walk you through some examples, and then what I'm gonna do is uh, bring up 
a friend of mine who's going to help me out, and we're going to Japify stuff live. Um, OK, so here are the three rules. So there's kind of like three ways you can Japify something. You can, I call them the three Ps. Makes it easy, right? Um, so you can change the product. You can change the way you prepare it. Or you can change the way it looks, the presentation, the ritual around it, and the aesthetics. So here's some examples. The ones at the top are things that already exist in Japan. So like pasta napoletan is like a thing that exists in Japan. They didn't have tomato sauce, so they used ketchup and Worcestershire sauce. And that's like a really staple thing you can eat in Japan. Uh, rice burger, it's kind of obvious. You take the bun out, you put rice there. Uh, so I took this same principle. The bottom are my inventions. I took a sloppy joe, and I put gyoza filling, and I made a sloppy gyo. And then I just put like delicious Japanese stuff on popcorn and made J-pop. Um, the puns are optional, but totally awesome. Okay, so preparation. Again, the top two things are things that exist in Japan. So curry udon, you take udon noodle soup and you take curry and you just like mash them together and you make something delicious. Um, taco rice is just what it sounds like. They didn't have tortillas, so they just put it on rice. Um, so I took the same thing, and I actually have to credit my brother for the bottom left. We had Christmas leftovers, and we were like, oh, how could we Japify this? We could make croque. So croquettes are super um, popular in Japan, and uh, turkey dinner croquettes. Uh, and bottom right, same thing, steak and eggs. I didn't have bread, I just put on rice. Okay, so the Japanese are also very um, well known for their presentation. Uh, the thing on the left, those are sandwiches, the top left. Uh, so like that beautiful bento box presentation, you know, so changing the presentation is just like the aesthetics of it, or it could be like some action you take. Uh, I don't know why, but the Japanese love making octopuses out of wieners. It's like a thing that every child knows. It's like children think that wieners are made from octopus because this is so common. Um, but I took this idea and I, I went like, okay, beef dip. Uh, so I did beef dip shabu shabu, which is like a hot pot style. So we did a bowl of broth in the middle of the table. We all cooked our meat in there, you know, made sandwiches. Uh, dipped it in some Japanese sauces. Delicious. Okay, so now I'm gonna call up the big guns. Literally, she has like really strong arms. This is my research assistant, Chihiro. Say hi, Chihiro. Huh? Hi. <laughs> so this is our first time actually live job flying. This usually happens after we have a, you know, four, or five, six beers. Um. Or <laughs> six of beer if you are Japanese like us. <laughs> um, okay. So bear us. We're gonna try our technique on callouts that you are just gonna call out. So if you have a food, so just think about like something you've made this week or something you've eaten this week. It could be something you ate out. Um, Grilled Whoa. cheese. Okay, we've actually japified that. <laughs> <laughs> so we're like super hungry at Strange Fellows on our like fifth beer. And we're like, grilled cheese sandwich, how do we japify this? And we're like, how about we add like uh, some miso paste instead of Vegemite? So it's pretty plain, you know, standard grilled cheese, but with a layer of miso in it, that extra umami flavor. <sighs> so that's so using good. product. The P we use there was product. Actually, all the ways we made grilled cheese was using product. Yeah. Um, the second way was we put kimchi in there. It was delicious. Okay. And then the third way was we actually took something completely different. We took um, basically cod roe, or not cod roe. Yeah, it's cod roe. Yeah, spicy cod roe. Me spicy cod roe, mentaiko, and mix that with cream cheese. So we kind of make a cream cheese cod roe sandwich. It's like caviar and cheese, right? Really high class. So good. <laughs> so those are three ways you can Japify your grilled cheese. Any other suggestions? Oh, poutine. Poutine. Um, well, like, okay, the Japanese eat curry almost more than any other food. <laughs> they eat it once a week, like on average. So I think you should put Japanese curry sauce on top of poutine. Yes. Japanese curry sauce, they, it comes in a box. <laughs> <laughs> Literally, like, though, <laughs> I made it on the television show, and I was like, nobody makes this from scratch. Everyone uses the box. So, yeah, I made it from scratch on the TV show, but you should just use the box. It's the most delicious. Okay, one more. Doll. Like lentil doll? Oh, nice. Okay. <laughs> Okay. I would just put 
put Japanese mayo on top of that in like a really cute pattern. Yeah. Presentation, yeah, done. Um, okay, story. well wait, is dal usually spicy? Okay, so you gotta <laughs> cut that out. No spicy. So take down the spice, but instead of lentils, like lentils are really hard to find in Japan, what would we use instead of lentils? Hmm. Like another edamame. kind of... Ooh, edamame. Shot like an edamame, edamame soup? It's kind of soupier, right, Dal? Okay. Could we do, are there any soups where like the beans are really cooked kind of mushy? Oh, what about like an okayu? Oh, Ooh, like the Japanese okay. kanji is okayu, and we'd have that with the lentils? Uh, actually, okayu, the rice gruel and lentils mixed together would be pretty freaking delicious. <laughs> so do that and then put some pickles on top. Japified. Uh, I think we can take one more. Samosas. <gasps> okay. They'd be really cute and small like this, and they'd be served on a skewer. Like okay. Three, three at a time. Yeah. yeah. Anything else? Anybody wants to drop a fight? Yes. Oh, deep, dip, fried, deep fried grilled tempura. cheese. Tempera grilled cheese. Look. People are already using the rules <laughs> to apply. So, okay, let's just dissect that one a little bit, just so I can like break down the framework. So we've already like done the first P product by changing out what's inside, and then we do the second P preparation by dipping it in batter and frying it. What could we do that's a third P? The presentation. Yeah, with that tempura fried. I'd serve it. Would you serve it in a different way? Like very Japanese style on a basket? Plastic grass. <laughs> oh, that's really good. I've never actually thought about <laughs> using the plastic grass. That's amazing. How about we cut it and we eat it with chopsticks? Is and then you would cut it up small and eat it with chopsticks. Um, roll or roll it up. Put it in a roll. And put it... Look. You I'm so, so proud of you guys. Any help. You guys are good to go. So, Hana, mm -hmm. um, you've written a book. You've been yes. on a TV show. Yes. Uh, maybe to tell us a little bit about what the TV show was. Uh, so the television show was myself and four other wonderful women, one of whom is actually taking video right now, Pai Lin. Uh, she has a YouTube channel called Hot Thai Kitchen. Uh, so each of the five of us uh, specialized in different cuisine. You can watch us on One World Kitchen at Gusto TV. <laughs> uh, maybe tell, tell everyone about sort of like the methodology of Lux Cooking. So let's cooking. So like, okay. <laughs> I'm going to get nerdy about museums Yes. Uh, so <laughs> when I'm in like exhibit development, I love user testing because like you don't know if it works unless you test it with people. It's just like that's... It makes sense to test it before <laughs> you make the thing. Uh, so I wanted to test the recipes. Um, so this is how it actually uh, like made sense for a museum studies degree. Like I had to curate a list of um, uh, recipes, and then I had to see how I could present it in a way that actually got people to make them. Because really, the success was like if you make it. The success is not you can read the sign and like pair it back to me. The success is like you can make it and it tastes good. So um, there was like an online way you could participate and give me feedback, but really the most valuable was like going to people's houses, watching people make the things, or inviting like 40 people to my house all at the same time and everyone took shifts in my kitchen and I got to actually taste what they made because that's like the proof is in the pudding. Yeah. That is awesome. Let's give uh, Hannah a warm round of applause.